Hello everyone, and today we'll be finishing up the uh, tutorial uh, to cloning, uh, cloning videos basically. So, <clears throat> I'm just going to pick up where I left off last time, and where we left off was the ligation, right? So at this point, our vector and DNA insert, which we're calling insert X, and our vector is PFAS back one, have been ligated together, ideally. So, <clears throat> To remind you, this is what we should have at this point, right? The orange is labeled PFAS back, and that's our vector that has been digested with XBA1 and ECOR1, and which have been connected or ligated to our insert X, which is our insert that we want to um, express later on, and that has been also digested by XBA1, ECOR1, and the two have joined together informing a brand new circularized vector and this is the vector that we are now going to transform into competent cells in order to clone millions and millions and millions of copies of this DNA that we want to purify. <clears throat> so what do I mean by transform? Right, so the next step after ligation is usually something called a transformation. A transformation in the most basic sense Meaning means to basically um, <clears throat> when you insert foreign DNA <coughs> into a bacteria, and then as the bacteria replicates, it also replicates. You know, clone. This is where the cloning process comes in. Cl also replicates or clones your uh, DNA in your DNA. Uh, vector. So bacteria has a uh, regular, you know, uh, linear DNA chromosomes, right? But it also has something special called plasmids that can be transferred from, you know, bacteria to bacteria and it also replicates as the, as the bacteria replicates. So they have these circular pieces of DNA. And basically what transformation is that we're inserting a foreign piece of circular DNA called a vector in order to make it basically a plasmid once it becomes accepted by the bacteria. And you know, the bacteria, <clears throat> as it replicates, it will just start amplifying more and more of your DNA that you wanted to uh, amplify. So that's basically the gist of a transformation. And uh, what it involves is, of course, you know, it's uh, physically putting the DNA into the uh, bacteria. And that can be accomplished either by heat shocking or electroporation. <clears throat> Again, I'm not going to go into the ex extreme details of you know the exact protocol of how you do a transformation because again, I can always cover that later on in the video or you know your PI or whomever might have a you know a specific protocol they want you to follow. So I'm not going to you know get into the details of what occurs. I'm just going to tell you kind of like generally what happens. So generally, what happens is that, um, one second, I'm just going to make a line here. Okay, so generally, what happens is that you mix, uh, oh, I don't know, anywhere from one microliter to uh, five microliters of uh, ligation product with, uh, with 10 microliters to 100 microliters of uh, competent cells. So again, usually competent cells are E. coli or Escherichia e. coli, and um, and you mix it together, and then you go on heat shocking or electroporation. Um, how much competent cells to use, and how much ligation product to use? Again, that will be defined by individually specific protocols. But as a general rule of thumb, you know, as you increase the amount of DNA and increase the amount of competent cells, the better chance you'll have it. Uh, having it to be transformed successfully, but that can also lead to you know way too many colonies or just wasting cells in process in the process because making competent cells is kind of a laborious task, and you don't really want to waste cells at all. And as a general rule, as a general uh, rule of thumb, is that the the DNA you mix with cells should not exceed 
of cells. So that's the maximum. So what that means is that if we're going to use 5 microliters of ligation product, you don't want to use anything less than 50 microliters of cells. If anything, you want to use more. So at 1 microliters, um, the minimum amount of cells you want to use is 10 microliters. So that's kind of a general rule of thumb. Um, so then, basically, a very critical part of transformation is the heat shocking or electroporation, again, depending on the cells you're using. Um, basically, what this does is that it creates uh, pores uh, within the membranes, or basically loosens right, the membranes, and then which allows the acceptance of... Uh, of DNA, of your vector, of your vector. So this is kind of the critical process. You don't want to overdo it. Usually, like heat shocking, respiration usually like lasts only a minute or two. Because if you overdo it, obviously you're gonna end up killing all your bacteria. You just want to have enough of it to kind of really loosen up the membranes, create these temporary pores in which your DNA can be physically, you know, moved inside the uh, the bacteria. So once you have that completed, you will usually then grow up the bacteria for like an hour or two to kind of rescue it. And then you want to plate it, plate it out on an auger plate with uh, antibiotics, selective, uh, selective, S okay, am I spelling it wrong? Oh man, I can't spell today. Biotics, selective, um, again, I can't spell, selective, um, depending on vector. So we're using the PFAS back, which is, has an ampicillin resistant gene. So we will obviously plate it on an auger plate containing ampicillin. So any clones that grow, or colonies that grow, should contain your insert that you want. But of course, when you do a transformation, especially after ligation, you wanna have a native control, which is just basically ligating your uh, vector with no insert at all, and seeing of how many clones that grew, right? So ideally, nothing should grow on a plate with just your vector. But of course, sometimes your vector can self-ligate in a weird way, and it'll still circulate, and thus, it'll still be able to be replicated, but there won't be any kind of insert within the uh, vector. So if you have very low amount of colonies on your negative plate, but then you have tons of colonies on your actual ligation plate, then you know you can say for sure like 90-99% of your colonies are correct. But just to make sure, usually what you would do is pick colonies, um, you grow them up, and then uh, you uh, extract their DNA. And you do this by using like a mini prep or mini prep or even like a maxi prep, I guess, depending how much bacteria and inoculum you use. It's, again, it's a kit that uses a column, um, column purification process that lights the bacteria and allows a vector a plasma DNA to stick onto the column and then you can elude it out. And then based on that, you take that DNA and uh, do a test digestion which means you take the small amount of DNA, and in our case, we would digest using e core one and XBOT1 to see if we get a profile of an insert that's 1.7 KB and a vector that's around 4.7 KB. And if we get something like that, then we know that the original product has to, ha has to have looked something like this. So in that case, we would identify correct clones. And based on that, you know, you can take some of that inoculant, grow more of that bacteria, so purify tons of this DNA, and then you can use that for whatever experiment you need to use it, whether for transfection, whether for another uh, transformation. Like in this case, we're using a PFAS back. We're not going, we can't really express it into, uh, you know, into a mammalian cells or anything. This needs to complement into a, a backman system. Again, I'm going to talk about that in different videos. That's just, you know, uh, depending on the cloning project, so I'm not going to get into that right now. But usually, your vector um, will be sufficient, it will contain all the necessary components for it to be expressed in, you know, whatever cell type that is designated to be um, for. And I will make a video kind of dissecting um, these vectors, kind of explain to everyone what, like, the different components are in, like, a general uh, vector. But again, that will be in a different video. So, 
Anyway, so once you have that, then you will have uh, the final product will be, you know, um, tons of purified DNA, which is your construct that you want, which is the one I just showed you, basically. And what, what will be good, usually a good concentration of, of DNA will be somewhere around 1,000 nanograms per microliter. You want to aim somewhere around here, but it's not a surprise if you get somewhere around 200 to 1,000. It can really vary, but 1,000 nanograms per microliter will be very, very nice. That means your bacteria grew extremely well and your purification went really well as well. So that's kind of ideal, I guess. And at this point, you know, you can use your DNA for a variety of things. Like I said, transfections, more transformations. You can use it for different assays. Again, depending on your lab and depending on the experiment, there's many things you can do with it. I'll probably end up making some videos explaining uh, different things you can do with your purified construct, I guess. But this kind of pretty much ends the whole cloning process. So in review, we started from just having primers to all the way finishing. We have millions and millions of copies of our uh, of our construct that we made, which again is this. So we started off with primers, and now we end, we have ended up with millions and millions and millions of copies of uh, of this one uh, DNA construct that's been purified. So that's basically. In a nutshell, what molecular cloning is really about. Mm, I know some of the details are kind of gla uh, glazed over, or glossed over. Uh, if you have any questions whatsoever at all, if anything is not clear, don't uh, hesitate to message me um, or leave me a comment or anything, and I will try to get back to you. It, it might be something I don't even know. You know, I might not understand it, or you know, I just might not have the. Uh, uh, answer for you but if that's the case you know I can always get back to you but at this point I think I have a fairly good understanding of the whole process that if you ask me questions I should be able to get back to you um, uh, relatively quickly so yeah so don't hesitate if you have any questions at all or if something's not clear just go ahead and message me I can probably help you out um, again I know I sound like a broken record at this point but I will make videos about troubleshooting stuff and about you know some of the nitty-gritty details and, and things like that but this tutorial video I think gives, gives a pretty good general idea of what molecular cloning really is and how you go about doing it so I think overall it was pretty good kind of rough but overall I think it was it was okay I think <laughs> I um, mean, hopefully the audience will agree, but I have no idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's pretty much it, I guess. And this concludes my tutorial number two, molecular cloning. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Maybe, um, hopefully you guys are now less than confused about some of these processes, uh, processes, I guess. And if you have any questions or concerns, comments, whatever, don't be afraid to message me, don't hesitate to contact me or anything like that. I'll be more than happy enough, uh, be more than happy enough to uh, talk to you guys and, you know, try to answer any kind of questions that you may have. Okay, well, I'll be signing off and I'll see what I'll be doing for my next tutorial or next set of videos. I have not, I'm not sure yet, but, you know, I'll know once I get to it, I guess. Okay. I'm signing off now.